Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It's good to be together on a beautiful fall day and give God all praise and all glory. He always deserves it at all times. We just forget that. And when we come together as his brother, as brothers and sisters, his children called by his name, redeemed by his grace and lift our voices, something happens. We're reminded again of who he is and what he deserves and that he's with us now and at all times. And so we're glad you're with us to worship God together. Let's, let's bow once more and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father God, we have sung your praises and and sometimes we come here, and if we're honest, we're just going through the motions. And so and right now, in this moment, we're asking you to help us by your spirit to attend to what you want to say. We believe because you've told us your word is living and active. We want to hear from you. So we ask you to speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you like poetry? That's what I thought. <laughs> a few of you. Uh, I do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Last hour, like a few sheepish hands. Hey, the bears aren't playing today. This afternoon, go home. You should read some poetry. You're a good way to spend your afternoon. It's going to be like, I'm not doing that, Pastor Jeff. Uh, one of my favorite poets is a poet named Gerard Manley Hopkins. Anybody ever heard of him? Less hands. Okay, good. Uh, he, he's got a, a great poem called God's Grandeur. The first line is, the, the, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Now you're probably going, what is he talking about? He means the, the world in which we live is charged with the greatness and glory of God. And it's flaming out, shining out at us all the time. This is Psalm 19, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, night after night, they pour forth speech. We're just not paying attention. We just only catch glimpses now and then. We don't often see God's glory. But it's always there, always present. Most of the time we have our heads down, going through our daily lives, and we don't see. We don't, we don't notice that the world is indeed charged with the glory and grandeur of God. But there are moments when we get glimpses, aren't there? Have you had moments? Have you had moments in your life when you caught a glimpse of the glory of God? Anybody? Yeah? Has it been a while, maybe? Fall day? Fall, I, for me, fall is the season when I catch glimpses. I mean, it's fleeting. We know what comes after fall, so we tremble. But it's still beautiful. Sun setting through the, the colors in the leaves and the tree. Crisp air. Maybe it's something different for you. Maybe it's the smile of your child, your son or your daughter, voice of encouragement from a friend, song on the radio, just a quiet moment in the morning before anybody else is up, and you, when you hear the voice of God, you feel him speak to you. We get little glimpses, don't we? But usually they're fleeting and they're short-lived, and most of the time we're not paying attention and we don't see. Recently, my nephew, Brendan, who's a law enforcement officer in Washington State, received some tough news in his family, and so he went to catch a glimpse of the glory of God. And the way he does that is he connects with God in nature. You know, it's a little easier when you're in Washington State, perhaps, than the Chicago suburbs. But he climbed a 200-foot tree and took this picture with his phone, I think, in a tree. That's, doesn't that look like it's like, it looks like Middle Earth to me, like a lonely mountain in the distance. And he took that from, from a tree because he wanted to connect with God and sent it to all of us. And I get to share it with you. Sometimes we need glimpses of God's glory, and we strive to find them in different ways. I don't know how that works for you in your life. Maybe you're tree climbers as well. But sometimes God gives us an unmistakable, undeniable, overwhelming sense of his glory. Those are rare. But a sense of his glory that you just can't, you just can't deny. It, 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 it floors you. You're not the same from it. The story in our series on the Gospel of Mark is perhaps the ultimate encounter with the glory of God, the ultimate glimpse of God's glory. We call it the transfiguration. Uh, it's certainly, you could maybe make some arguments that those, some Old Testament characters had similar opportunities or in, uh, glimpses of God's glory, but in the New Testament, this has to be at the top. And frankly, uh, other than the resurrection, it's the key moment of God's glory. Peter, James, and John are the three that get to get this glimpse with Jesus. You might call them the inner ring, the inner circle of Jesus. I mean, he had the 12, his disciples who he called, but then there's Peter, James, and John who are, they're kind of insiders. They get, they get inside look at things that others don't get. For example, when Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, only those three get to go in and see it firsthand. 
And here they're going to get a glimpse of God's glory that's unlike anything else. The encounter takes place a week after Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ. Remember that? Last week, if you were with us, the sermon was that Peter confesses, you're the Christ. Who do people say that I am? Well, they don't know. Elijah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah. You're the one. You're him. Exactly, Peter. That was revealed to you by God. Later, P Peter, in the next moment, says something totally wrong, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. But uh, that's kind of like us, isn't it? One moment, I've, I'm fixated on the glory of God. I get the right answer. The next moment, I get it totally wrong. Well, then Jesus goes on to say that he will die and that we too must deny ourselves and take up our cross if we're going to follow him. And then about a week later, they have this encounter. We call it the transfiguration. Let's look at verses 2 through 13 of Mark chapter 9. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly... Looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it, is, it is written, the Son of Man, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did him whatever they pleased, as it, is, as it is written of him. In Luke's account of the very same story, he tells us that Jesus took Peter, James, and John on up to the mountain to pray. Kind of like a prayer retreat with Jesus. How many of you would like to go on a prayer retreat on a mountainside with Jesus? Any takers? Yeah, how amazing would that be? I don't know what the disciples, those three, expected when they went up on the mountain with Jesus to pray, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't this. It wasn't to see Moses and Elijah and Jesus shining in all the radiance of God's glory. They got more than they expected, I'm certain of that. The text simply says Jesus was transfigured before them. That's the Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get our English word metamorphosis from. It means to be changed. And it's specifically to be changed on the outside that reflects an, a reality on the inside. So to be changed in appearance out externally that reflected an internal reality. The point being... They're seeing something now on the outside of Jesus that was always there. His glory, his radiance, shining out in a way that they hadn't seen it before. The, verse 3 says that he was radiant and intensely white, his clothes. So, so white that nobody on earth could bleach them that way. I think that's funny. Like OxyClean can't get this white. Tide Ultra can't touch it. Whatever you're putting on your teeth to make them whiter. By the way, some people on TV need to stop with the whitening because like, it's crazy looking their teeth. They get so white. But even that doesn't compare to what we're talking about here. It's an, uh, it's an otherworldly white, a brilliance. The point is, it's coming from inside of Jesus. The glory of God is not shining down on him from heaven, from the outside. It's radiating out from inside. You know the hymn we sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing at Christmas time? Do you know that hymn? You know the phrase in that hymn? Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Veiled in flesh, Jesus has come in the flesh. The exact imprint of the Father, the radiance of his glory in flesh. So it's veiled. We don't see him clearly. Even they didn't quite recognize him. And Mark's whole gospel is a slow unveiling of who Jesus is. But in this moment, it's like the veils pulled back a little bit and the brilliance of his glory is radiating out. And it's amazing. I think in our lives... Not like this story. Every now and then we get the gray veil of this world pulled back a little bit. And we get a little glimpse of the glory of God, of who he really is. And they get this in a profound way. This is the presence of glory. No, it's been there all along. They just didn't see it. They didn't understand it. See him for who he is. Last week, Peter confessed, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ. And this week, this transfiguration is like an exclamation point on Peter's confession. The confirmation. 
I think about this. The disciples spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, they got a little break here and there when Jesus would, would, would withdraw to pray. But for the most part, they spent all their time with Jesus. And they're still in the process of discovery. In his book, Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer, C.S. Lewis writes this. He says, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. Later at the end of the same chapter, Lewis will say that the, the key for us is to pay attention, to remember, to come awake, still more to stay awake to the presence of God in the world. So, why, so we are surrounded by the glory and presence of God all day, every day. We just don't see. Why? Why don't we? Well, for one, he's walking incognito, right? He, it's veiled. One, we're not paying attention. But also, it's, we don't get the full picture. And it would overwhelm us if we did. This is the problem of glory. Paul David Tripp, in his commentary on this passage, says that the disciples and we have a glory problem. And what's our glory problem? We are created by the God of all glory, made for relationship with him in glory. We hunger and long for glory. We spend our life looking for it. We don't call it that, but we are looking for it, wanting glimpses of it. And yet, if we got what we long for, it would undo us. It would crush us. It would be too much for us. The Hebrew word for glory, by the way, is the word kavod. And we think, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word glory. Maybe you think shininess, radiance. And there's some gleaming shininess going on in the story. But glory doesn't mean shininess. It, it literally, the Hebrew word has to do with weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, significance, heaviness. The significance, the weight of who God is in his glory would crush you. That's why in the Old Testament, Moses says, show me your glory. And God's like, eh. He doesn't say, eh. He says, no, you probably can't handle that, Moses. I'll give you a glimpse as I pass by. It's too much for you. Why is that? Our glory problem is our sin problem. Still, we long for it. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. Who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. That's God dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. We can't approach him. He's beyond us. He's the Holy One, and we are not. And then in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 9, Mark says this. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, but this is, can we just admit, Peter's hilarious. What is he talking about? It's good that we're here. Like he sees Jesus shining the glory of God. Moses and Elijah are there. And he says, hey, let's build some tents. Let's have a camp out. What do you think, Jesus? And he says, for he did not know what to say. What should you say when you don't know what to say? Huh? It's not a trick question. Like just just in case you ever find yourself on the mountain of the Lord, you see Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and you're not sure what to say, here's a tip. Don't say anything. (laughs) Say nothing, right? (laughs) For they were terrified. That's the point. Matthew's account tells us they're face down, shaking in fear. They come into the presence of God. This is our problem of glory. They fell face down. The glory was too much for them. And we read in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 35, the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because of the cloud that settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the tent of meeting, and that's the same root word that Peter uses when he talks about building these little booths, these little tabernacles. He's referring to, like, stay here, and the presence of God will dwell among us. I think that's interesting. I don't know about you, but when I get glimpses of God's glory, and they're fleeting, like yours, probably they're somewhat rare, I want to keep them. Don't you want to, like, I want to stay there. Or I want to go back to that moment when I felt that way, when I thought those thoughts, when I prayed that way. But some, it feels like you can't. Does that ever feel that way to you? Like, like, it's like water slipping through your fingers. You can't keep it. You can't hold it. I think there's a sense in which Peter's saying, let's stay right here. Let's stay right here in this moment. This is incredible. So that's our human condition, our problem of glory. We're created for it. We long for it. We search for it, even if we don't know it by name. And yet, because of sin... We can't handle it. We can never enter into it. 
We're on the outside looking in. This brings us to the purpose of glory. What's happening here? Why this weird story of on the mountain with all the shining glory going on and Moses and Elijah? Well, Peter, James, and John are being given a picture of the future in the present because of what they're about to go f- through. Remember, in, in Mark's gospel, it, it, Jesus has been in the north part of, of Galilee, in the northern part of Israel. He's now moving toward Jerusalem. There's a turning point happening here with Peter's confession of Christ and the transfiguration. All events now lead to Jerusalem. All roads lead there where the conflict will intensify and eventually it'll uh, culminate in the betrayal, arrest, torture, and crucifixion of Jesus. He knows this is going to happen. He knows that his 12 disciples who spent every day with him are going to see horrific things, namely their rabbi, their master, their Lord, the one that Peter says is, is him, is going to be tortured, disfigured, brutally executed. They're going to be tempted to wonder, what is this? what have we been doing with our lives? What has happened? Where is God? This makes no sense. Jesus is giving them a glimpse of what comes after the horrors of the cross because they're going to need it for what they're about to go through. Later, Peter will write this in 1 Peter, uh, 2 Peter, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Later, Peter's going to, this is going to be the defining moment for him. He's going to write about this. But in this moment, God is saying essentially, I want you to see what comes after the cross. Things are going to get dark. Things are going to get bad. It's going to look really ugly. It's going to look like I'm defeated and the kingdom of God is obliterated. Don't believe it. Don't you believe it. Don't doubt it. I'm going to give you a glimpse of how it all ends. I want you to tuck that away and remember. This is the sure and certain future that Christ will establish when he returns in glory for us on the other side of the cross. We too get a glimpse through this very text and in our lives and through the revelation of God in Scripture of what's coming, of where history's headed. And we too are tempted. I don't know if you, I look out of the world to you and think, where's God? This, what's happening? Where's the kingdom? We need these glimpses. Through all the suffering and darkness of the world, God is moving history inexorably toward its fulfillment in the glorification of his son. So when you hear uh, stories about the, the church diminishing and people rejecting Jesus and it looks like there's just horrific things and people who proclaim the name and, and profess to be pastors in his name doing terrible things, grieve, lament, pray, but don't doubt that he will be glorified. Okay, but How? How's this all going to work out? And what about the two guys? Why are Moses and Elijah there? I have some questions about this story. Do you have questions about it? I have some questions. Like, here's a question. How did Peter, James, and John know it was Moses and Elijah? They didn't have photographs. They didn't have Facebook pages to check. They didn't stalk them. Oh, that looks like Elijah, right? They didn't pull out their picture Bible and say, well, it kind of looks like there were no portraits. I don't think Moses introduced themselves. Hey, Jesus. Uh, you may not know me, but I'm Moses, like he would have known. How do they know? Well, one is they just knew. Meaning the same way that Peter knew Jesus was the Messiah, and G- Jesus says that was revealed to you by my Father, a kind of spiritual knowledge. It's also possible that they're having a conversation, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and the disciples are listening, and Jesus is talking to them about who they are and the events that they experienced that they may have picked up on the clues in the conversation. But one thing we can take from this is, is this. I often hear people ask me this question. Hey, will we know each other in heaven? Have you ever wondered that? Will we recognize people that we love in heaven? Yes, you will. You will not cease to be you when you're glorified with your Father in heaven. When God made you, he made you for eternity. Moses is still Moses. Now he's Moses sharing in the glory of the Son, 
but he doesn't cease to be who he is. In fact, you'll be more you than you are now when you're in his presence, but you'll still be you. And we will, of course, know each other and recognize each other in that day. Your identity does not end at your death in this life, but you will share in the glory of your Savior. For 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, To this he calls you through the gospel, so that we may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You made for it. You're going to share in it. And do you wonder what they were talking about, Moses and Elijah, with Jesus? Like, what were they talking about? Wouldn't that have been fun to listen to that conversation? But Peter, stop talking and listen. Well, Luke in his account tells us a little clue about what they're talking about. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They spoke of his departure. Whose departure? Jesus' departure. What do you mean departure? Not just from that mountain, but from this earthly life. He's going to be crucified, resurrected, and ascend. He's about to accomplish that at Jerusalem. This is what they're talking about. This is their conversation. Why were they talking about this? Well, a couple things here. Moses um, is, is symbolic representation. I mean, he's there. They see him. But he also represents what we call the law. You ever see in the New Testament the, the phrase, the law and the prophets? Shows up a lot, right? The law, the law came through Moses at Sinai. So Moses represents the law. Elijah, one of the chief prophets of the Old Testament, so when we read the law and the prophets, remember in Matthew 5, Jesus says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So you have Moses, the law, Elijah, the prophets, Jesus, the fulfillment, right there on the mountain in glory. They're discussing the very purpose of Christ, the reason for which he came. This is the how and the why of God's glory. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, God will accomplish the purposes of his greatness and glory and the glory of his gospel. We gain access to the grace of God and his glory for eternity through the death and res resurrection of Jesus. It's the whole ballgame. It's why he came. The disciples don't quite grasp this. And Moses and Elijah are asking about it, which I find fascinating. In fact, if you read the New Testament book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 is sometimes called the Faith Hall of Fame. You read through that chapter, and you'll notice there's all these Old Testament heroes listed. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, Noah. And they, all what they did by living by faith. And at the end of chapter 11, it says, none of them received what they longed for. They all saw through a glass darkly, to use Paul's language. They didn't grasp how God was going to accomplish his great redemptive purposes, but they lived by faith that he would. And then at the end of the chapter, it, it, this is how it reads. And all those, all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us. That apart from us, they should not be made perfect. What does that mean? Well, they look forward, and it's veiled. They can't quite see or comprehend. We look backward to the certainty of the empty tomb and the cross. God had planned something better for us, that together with us, they would be made perfect. Who's they? Well, part of it is Moses and Elijah. Think about that. Moses and Elijah standing on the mountain talking to Jesus. This, this is how you're going to do it? This is what the, the mystery from before the beginning of time was all about? This is how you will achieve your purpose and your glory on earth? Yes, this is by dying and by rising. It's incredible. Jesus crucified and risen. He is the glory and power of God. That's why he came. He reveals to us who God is. John 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God at the Father's side has made him known. That sounds confusing. If no one has seen God, how can God make God known? It's referring to Jesus. No one's ever seen God. He's unapproachable. He dwells in unapproachable light. But God, who's at the Father's side, has made him known. The exact imprint of his nature. Or when Thomas asks, show us the Father, and Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember our glory problem, right? We can't enter in. We can't handle it. 
And, and the truth is, we're also kind of glory thieves. We want it for ourselves rather than to reflect it in him. This brings us to the person of glory. Because the person of glory, Jesus Christ, is the solution to our glory problem. In order to understand this, we need to talk about the cloud. There's a cloud. I don't mean the cloud like the Google cloud. I don't understand how that cloud works, but apparently you, things are in the cloud. Right now there's a cloud. Things are in it. I mean, did you know this? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the cloud that descends and envelops them. In Jewish thought, the presence of God is connected to the cloud. The cloud, the pillar of cloud guided the Israelites by day and fire by night. The cloud would descend on the tabernacle whenever they would stop and fill the place with his presence. The cloud descended on the temple after Solomon built it. It was dedicated uh, in the Old Testament. And the Jews of Jesus' day longed for the return of the Messiah when the cloud would come back and fill the temple with the presence of God. Incredible significance in the cloud. Now look at Mark 9, 7 and 8. And the cloud overshadowed them. The cloud came, overshadowed, enveloped them, Peter, James, and John, in the cloud. You're not supposed to be in the cloud. You can't go in the cloud. God is there. It would undo you, but they are there. And a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Here's Matthew's account. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their face and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. The cloud overshadows them, and they're enveloped in the cloud. No wonder they're scared. You know, I'll hear people say things to me like, You know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have some questions for God. I'm going to have some things to say to him when I get to heaven. When I, when I, when I see God, I've got to have some things. That I'm going to, I would give him peace of my mind, right? You know, you, first of all, you have none to spare, right? You have to think about that. I, I, friends, when we come into the presence of God, it will not be like that. You'll be on your face, either in worship or in terror. And they, they, these disciples, these Jewish men, they know the stories of the cloud. They know that God in the Old Testament, the Yahweh, who they have worshipped their whole life, is unapproachable. He's hidden. There's, he's, he's there. He's present. They want to obey him and follow him. But you can't quite get to him. And you don't go in the cloud because that destroys you. Moses, who we were told spoke to God face to face, metaphorically, doesn't go into the cloud when it descends on the tabernacle. And yet... The cloud descends on them. There's always a kind of hiddenness to God. And here's the beautiful thing. Out of the hidden, this hidden God in the cloud speaks. And what he says is the whole point. God speaks out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The God who you can't approach, who seems mysterious and distant, is saying, I want you to know me. I want to be known by you. I want you to know who I am. And I've made that possible. And here's how. It's him, the person of glory. This is my son, the identity of Christ. Listen to him, your response. Could it get simpler? God says to those of you, even today, to us, who feel like he's far away, he's distant, I don't understand him, I don't understand what he's doing, I don't grasp him. By the way, for those who say, I don't understand what God is doing, or why he isn't doing certain things, or why he allows this to happen, you're exactly right. You don't understand. And neither do I sometimes. Frankly, I don't want a God that I can completely understand. Because if you could completely understand God, then you have a God that's limited to the measure of your ideas about him. And that's a pretty small God. Some of you are smarter than others, right? But we're all finite. And if God is, could be contained with my understanding, that's not a God worth worshiping. But just because you can't understand God doesn't mean you can't know him. You know the difference? Your child, your son or daughter, when they're born... Do they understand all about you? Do they understand what goes on in their mother or father's mind and heart? Do they understand the decisions you have to make as a parent? No. But they know you. They know your love. They know your presence. They know your touch. They know your voice. I know it's an imperfect analogy, but friends, you can know God even if you have questions, even if he seems mysterious at times. 
And that's the voice speaking out of the cloud is saying exactly that. This is my son. This is how you know me. Listen to him. And Matthew's account is so beautiful. Matthew tells us a little more detail. He says they're on their faces. And Jesus comes to them. And he touches them. Saying, rise, have no fear. They're trembling before the glory of God, thinking it's going to undo them. And isn't it interesting that the moment has shifted now. Mark says after this, they don't see anybody else, just Jesus. The cloud is lifted. The shininess and glory and radiance has dissipated. Elijah and Moses are gone, and it's just Jesus. What does that teach you? What does it teach you that when it's all said and done, the glimpse is over, it's just Jesus? He's the one. He's what you need. And sometimes in my life, if I'm honest, I'm trying to go back to that moment when I felt close to him, that moment I'm trying to recapture something in the past, some moment when I felt closer to him, when I felt my faith was stronger, where I felt like I, I got it more. And though, that's not given to me to go back there, but to go forward with Jesus. The disciples have to come off the mountain. Peter wants to stay. He wants to have like an eternal camp out with Jesus on the mountain. But they have to come down because they, like us, have to walk by faith and not by sight. They have to go back to the disciples and try to go forward, and they're going to go forward into some pretty dark stuff, some pretty awful things in their lives. But it's, it's God is saying to them, I want to show you how this is going to finish. I want you to listen to my son when it matters most. I want you to remember his voice. Jesus comes and touches them and says, rise, have no fear. Three things I think the passage shows us briefly. Christ will be glorified. They get a glimpse of the future. It's a certainty. It's a historic certainty that he will be glorified. They would see it in the resurrected Jesus who would ascend to heaven. We will one day see it when he returns in glory or when we meet him face to face. And Christ will be glorified. Two, Christ will share his glory with men and women who know him, who trust him. And three, through Christ, you can stand in the presence of Almighty God without fear. How amazing is this story? Jesus will be glorified, don't you doubt it. When you look out at the world and it seems bleak and dark, he will be glorified. He will share his glory with you if you trust in him. Repent and trust and follow him. And you can stand in the presence of God, the unapproachable one, without fear because of Christ. What a perfect way for us to come to the table as we close the service. And in case you came in afterwards and did not receive the elements, would you just put your hands up? The ushers will come make sure that you have communion elements. Some here in the front, I see. Some up here, Doug. Make sure that you put your hand up. They'll make sure you get the elements. Sadly, the, the bread and cup in Christian history has sometimes been used as an instrument of division to determine who's in and who's out. We believe, the New Testament teaches, that at the cross and the empty tomb, Jesus has thrown the doors open. So this is not our table. It's not Chapel Street's table. It doesn't matter if you're a member here or, or if it's your first time here. What matters is the two things that the New Testament makes plain. If you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you know he's your only hope now and for, forever, and two, you're willing to examine your own heart right where you sit, then you are welcome at his table. Let's pray and prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, we all need glimpses of your glory. We all long for it. We're made for it. And sometimes we just miss it. We're not paying attention. But you have made yourself known to us. Teach us to hear your voice, to listen to you and obey. Forgive us for the times when we haven't, when we shrink back, when we leave the things undone that you've called us to do and when we do the things you've clearly told us not to and for the corruption and weakness and deceit and darkness in our own hearts, 
We ask your forgiveness. We ask you to remind us now once again as we come to your table of the greatness of your love through your blood and your body given for us. This, what we hold in our hands, seems so simple and so trite, but it is a glimpse of your glory. Your body, your blood given for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Just peel off that first layer. And I'll remind you that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and passed it to his disciples and said, This is my body, and it is given for you. The bread of Christ, eat in his memory. The New Testament tells us that after they had eaten together, Jesus poured out a cup saying, This is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. The cup of Christ and of salvation. Drink and remember him. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in the glory, the grace of the great I am. May you catch a glimpse of his love and mercy this week as you seek to follow him. Amen. And go in peace. Memories is complete. Still my lips shall